don't, uh, um, why don't these people keep the gardens properly? Like, don't you see the middle class colony? They're beautiful flowers, there's this, there's that. And then you ask people, so what happened? Why are there no flowers here? They'll say, no one is putting flowers here. I mean, who's, are they giving us any grass? Does this, does this look like part to you? So we're supposed to now buy all this, all these flowers from the money we don't have and put gardens there. Um, so I asked, uh, but when you have a garden like this, and this belongs to this particular family, don't you object? You know, doesn't the neighbor then also want? You know, how does this work? And they say, no, oh, but we have a passion, and we've bought all these things, and this is a neem tree. They can also take from the neem tree, and um, we are just taking this green for the moment till something else will happen. So what you see is all these gardens coming up, and people asserting the right to the garden by way of explaining the labor they're putting into it and the money they said, I want for 10, 10 rupees these plants. I am going there every morning and giving water. And there's a whole routine. They get up an hour earlier at 4 o'clock, then they water the plant, and they this, and then at 5 o'clock they catch the bus to go to the city for work. Because it'll take them two hours to travel, and then they come back by 10 o'clock. So in other words, rather, I initially thought the neighbors would object, some politics would be behind this, some neighbor would have said, hey, you can do it, you cannot. But it's not. It's, if you ask neighbors, they will say, but see, some greenery has come, and they have the passion to do it. Now, who gets up at 4 o'clock to, you know? So um, then I said, how do you know? And then of course they'd say, oh, this is something we know. And you see how they mobilize all this knowledge, how they talk, what they did in the village and everything. So what I'm basically arguing is they're reading this landscape not as an urban landscape but as a rural landscape. And by mixing the urban, making the house, and making, really kind of imagining it through an urban and creating that hybrid, they're actually surviving. This will go at some point. At some point, you know, it'll be so established neighborhood that we will not see these gardens. But you see how in a moment of crisis, people make the land work for them. And I think what I'm trying to do in my, in my research is trying to understand what is the learning that happens here that brings people or that, that enables people to survive under conditions that are impossible. None of us could survive under these conditions. I live from out there and I've had real, real difficulties. So the question is not just what kind of violence is done to them. We must talk about it, but we also must talk to us. People living out there, they're surrounding you, they're everywhere, they're there. So how do they do it? And in this case, the answer is they're superimposing an urban and a rural gaze onto the landscape and thereby are able to kind of evoke it differently than the officer. Right? So you see, he hears this drying going on, this is all the village stuff, it's all come from the village. Then you see what? So whenever they get a chance to collect goods, they will they will collect it in great uh, in great quantity and then sell it or use it over the whole season or when rainy season comes and they can have it. Um, then you see the garden. Here you see of course the um, um, the cooking outside. Here we have another. Uh, there's I think mango trees. What are some things happening here? So if there's land, why don't we use it? And when they want to make a park later? I need to see my friends then. Excess of 
of violence, and there's a surrender to the landscape. There's a whole lot to this, right? There's, a, there's also problems because, I mean, if Gorgon doesn't have sewage, what do you think they have? They don't have sewage, they don't have water. We're talking about they have nothing. They don't, they, when they came there, the people, it was an agricultural land. There were no plots marked. There's still no water line after 10 years. They don't have a water line. So the tanker comes once in a while. Um, and of course, there's no garbage uh, collection. There's no toilets. So we would make these little toilets to have the girls right, you know, have, uh, to be safe and have right in front of the house the toilet. <coughs> And this is where then our other painting of landscape comes in as this dystopian. So there we have the official MCT Walla who has a certain aesthetic of the whole thing. There's people kind of saying this, you know, we turn this into kind of an agricultural environment. And we build our houses to make sure it's also urban. And there comes, of course, a, a third reading, which is brought by the NGOs, and which is another necessary reading that is one of the dystopian, but a lot of corners where you have dirt, where you have. Uh, garbage bags, and plastic bags, where you have these toilets, um, where you need solution because you have something lots of in a very small, congested place, right? This is one of the official MCD toilets, um, which people don't prefer to use, but the problem is the, the toilet has a sewage, but it doesn't go anywhere. So this is the end of the sewage line for the public toilet. But people say, if that's the condition, you might as well shit in front of the house, it doesn't make it.
decided to, uh, where do you test uh, the privatization of water? Among the poorest people where is. <laughs> you know, you're probably speaking about the, the Indian state that this is the best example. So what they have done is the MCB is in there and we don't put a switch line, we don't put a water line. We also have no um, plans of doing this in the near future, giving a tender to uh, permit uh, private water purifiers uh, to uh, put in their plant there and then sell uh, um, the liter for, I think the liter is 25 cents per liter. Um, so everyone buys the car and no one uses it. Ah. So, yes. so they all have a car. Uh, everyone has a car, but no one uses it. So I asked, so the, the, how often do you load it? You have to load 100 rupees. How often do you load it? I, no, there's still some money on it, and this is since two years. So people can, you know, they can afford to circumvent these things and uh, do their own thing. And I find this quite remarkable. I mean, that you know, you can't so easily. Uh, they can't so stupid. I mean, they're not always intelligent, but they're practically quite uh, enabled. So what do I mean by entrepreneurialism? I mean um, struggle uh, the conditions of struggle uh, over limited resources, um, which creates conflicting regimes of regulation, advanced commercialization of space and resources, and it's within this that uh, you know people make things uh, work in quite surprising ways. And this is what can be interesting. And to come back to um, what I think about this being an urban space, so as much as it's a village space, there's very interesting. So there's a wall. And you wonder why is this wall there? And I ask them, so what is this wall? And they say, oh, behind this wall is Halayana. <laughs> there's nothing behind this wall except there's a field. But you can see how the yet are still part of this is still Delhi. You might not think it's Delhi, but it's still you behind this is Halayana. So I thought this was a very nice reminder of don't think you have villages because we do village things. <laughs> this is basically kind of my narrative. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's been a really, really great job. Very Stimulating. We have a little bit of a different format today, which I'll introduce you to, to you in a minute. And I think one of the things your talk, at least for me, and many questions you've opened up also, perhaps an avenue to understand the surroundings of this university as well. Although it's not a resettlement project, but you know how we visualize the struggles that you know members of the community around this very, uh, if I may say, so elite project that is happening also exist. But what we want to do today is to ask uh, Dr. Arne Hans to maybe summarize the talk briefly and then open it up for discussion. And I want to also add that uh, it was uh, Dr. Hans who contacted Professor Ra, so we're very grateful for you for doing that today.